Catherine Simpson had always felt like her stepfather, 48-year-old Paul Selwood, behaved in suggestive and inappropriate ways, but it seemed like nobody in her family believed her. Her suspicions were confirmed shortly before her 19th birthday in 2021 when she found a camera hidden in her lingerie at her home in Northamptonshire, England. She went to the police who made several more disturbing discoveries regarding Selwood's spying activities and he was arrested on multiple charges. In 2023, Selwood admitted to six criminal counts, including voyeurism, and was sentenced to 22 months in prison. Simpson described the punishment as a slap on the wrist and laughable, compared to certain other crimes that seem trivial in comparison but can carry longer sentences like marijuana possession. After waiving her automatic right to have her identity protected due to the nature of Selwood's crimes, Simpson came forward with her story claiming that nobody took her seriously when she tried discussing her stepfather's alarming behavior years earlier. She said that even her mother brushed off her concerns but has since apologized for doing so along with other family members who realized in hindsight that she had been right all along. Number 16. Rico Robertson and Maria Bustamante Most Americans spend the 4th of July indulging at cookouts and watching fireworks. But a group of co-conspirators in Bristow, Oklahoma had something entirely different on their minds during the holiday in 2015. In what seemed like a routine transaction, a thief, dressed as an armored truck employee, entered a Walmart store and collected a $70,000 cash deposit from the assistant manager. He left in a Chevy sedan and the real armored truck stopped at the store two days later. Based on their findings, detectives with the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation concluded that the store's manager, 43-year-old Rico Robertson, had masterminded the robbery plan. Robertson's stepdaughter, 21-year-old Maria Bustamonte, was accused of driving the thief to and from the store on the day of the crime. Investigators identify the phony armored truck employee as 22-year-old Brian Javante Johnson, a distant relative of Rico's from California. At the time of the theft, Johnson remained at large and was also wanted in California for several robberies and a shooting. It's unclear whether he was captured. The charges against Rico were dropped in 2016 after he was deemed incompetent to stand trial due to a massive stroke he suffered after the heist. Records show that Buster Monte pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit grand larceny and grand larceny in exchange for a 10-year deferred sentence. Number 15. Justin Stein In January of 2022, an Australian girl named Charlize Mouton vanished in the Blue Mountains of New South Wales. At the time, she lived with her grandparents on the Gold Coast and was in the Sydney area to spend Christmas break with her mother, Callista Mouton, and her soon-to-be stepfather, 31-year-old Justin Lawrence Stein. Charlize was due to return home in a few weeks when Callista reported her missing. Stein told police that he had last seen Charlize at his family's home in the village of Mount Wilson. He claimed that he left her in the care of another adult while he went to pick up Callista and that Charlize was gone when they returned to the property. Investigators were immediately suspicious of Stein's story, but he denied any involvement in Charlize's disappearance. A few days later, he tried to pin the blame on Callista, but phone records and other evidence ruled her out as a suspect, while adding to the growing pile of evidence against Stein. Location data show that Stein had towed a boat several hundred miles on the day of Charlize's disappearance. Using coordinates obtained from his phone, police found Charlize's body in a remote location along the Colo River. Four days after she went missing, she had been shot twice after consuming a toxic amount of the medication quetiapine, which was prescribed to Stein for schizophrenia. Stein was arrested and jailed on suspicion of murder and continued to implicate himself in the crime from behind bars. Using information gleaned from jailhouse phone calls, detectives found the buried murder weapon which Stein had asked his mother to dig up and relocate. After deliberating for two weeks, a jury found him guilty of murder in June of 2024. He faces a maximum term of life imprisonment and is due to be sentenced in August. Number 14. Najib Kain Chow 
In August of 2023, 21-year-old University of Washington student Angelina Tran awoke to her mother being attacked at their Seattle home by her 54-year-old stepfather, Najib Kain Chow. She immediately tried to intervene and became the target of Chow's rage, giving her mother an opportunity to run downstairs and dial 911. Chow and Tran fell to the floor in a struggle against one another before Chow gained the upper hand and dragged his stepdaughter into the kitchen. He grabbed a knife and stabbed Tran over 100 times and continued to plunge the blade into her body even after she stopped fighting and fell unconscious. Chow took several breaks throughout the attack, stopping at various times to change his clothes, look for Tran's mother, and to find a meat cleaver to bludgeon Tran with. Police arrived at the home to find Chow holding the blood-covered knife in his hand. He obeyed officers' commands to drop the weapon and reportedly admitted that he had just killed someone. Tran was pronounced dead at the scene. Thanks to the young woman's bravery, her mother survived. Chow pleaded not guilty to first-degree murder and attempted murder and is awaiting trial at the King County Correctional Facility with bail set at $5 million. Number 13. Elisa Marie Torres In June of 2019, 29-year-old Elisa Marie Torres murdered her stepfather and her own daughter at an apartment complex in Port St. Lucie, Florida. Police arrived at the residence in the middle of the night to find 54-year-old Felix Rivera and Amarillis Martinez dead from gunshot wounds to the head. Rivera's wife, 53-year-old Marisol Rivera, was found injured but alive. She told police that she couldn't sleep earlier that night, so she took two sleeping pills that Torres had given her. A few hours later, she awoke to a popping sound and her daughter standing at the foot of her bed. Before fleeing the scene in a vehicle, Torres pistol whipped her mother and threw her to the floor, then shot the second victim. Police tracked her down several hours later at a home in Fort Pierce. Torres admitted to stealing Felix's gun and waiting until everyone was asleep before shooting him in the head and she said that she also planned to kill Marisol until her mother fought back. In December of 2020, Torres pleaded no contest to two counts of first-degree murder with a firearm and one count of attempted first-degree murder with a firearm in order to avoid the death penalty. She was sentenced to three life terms without the possibility of parole. In a victim impact statement, the convicted murderer's mother told the judge that the person Torres has become does not reflect how she was raised and that she didn't understand how her daughter got to this point in her life. Alicia's brother, Charles Olivencia, praised Felix for embracing his stepchildren as his own and providing them with a loving and stable household. Torres's reasons for killing the victims remain a mystery to this day. Number 12. Michael Turney when high schooler Elise Turney vanished in Phoenix, Arizona on the last day of her junior year in 2001, police initially assumed she was a runaway. Her stepfather, Michael Turney, told law enforcement that he arrived home to find a handwritten goodbye note, indicating that Elisa had left on her own accord. As the investigation progressed, however, he became the prime suspect in the case. Elisa's body has never been found, but there was also a distinct lack of evidence to suggest that she might still be alive. Her cell phone, makeup and other belongings were left behind at her home and she never touched the $1,800 that was in her bank account when she disappeared, which made no sense since she would have needed the money to survive. According to law enforcement, Michael Turney was bizarrely obsessed with his teenage stepdaughter. He monitored her activities and movements with multiple security cameras, both inside and outside the home, and recorded all incoming and outgoing calls on his landline phone. One of Elisa's friends told investigators that she had complained about Michael behaving inappropriately toward her, which only heightened their suspicions that he had possibly killed her. Michael claimed that he installed the surveillance cameras for safety reasons and denied spying on Elisa or harming her in any way. He was never linked to her disappearance through forensic evidence and years passed without any arrests. Even after Elisa's siblings began to voice their belief that Michael had killed her, finally, in 2020, 18 years after Elisa went missing, prosecutors decided to pursue a second-degree murder charge against Michael, who was now in his 70s based on circumstantial evidence. He continued to maintain his innocence from behind bars as he spent the next three years in jail while awaiting trial. In July of 2023, the judge dismissed the case based on a lack of evidence. 
To prove that Michael caused Elisa's death, Michael's 49-year-old son, James Turney, expressed his disappointment at the outcome of the case in an interview with NBC News later that year, saying that there has been no justice for Elisa and that the system has failed her 100%. While he's no longer hopeful that his father will be convicted of Elisa's murder, he continues to focus his efforts on raising awareness about the psychological abuse he believes Michael inflicted on his stepsister in hopes that it will lead to changes in how these types of cases are handled. Number 11. Henri Michel Piet In the late 90s, Rosalind McGuinness accused her mother's boyfriend, Henri Michel Piet, of abuse. In light of the allegations, McGuinness's mother left Piet and moved with her children to Poteau, Oklahoma. Despite her efforts to protect her family, Piet kidnapped Rosalind from her school one day in 1997 and fled town. He held her captive for nearly 20 years, during which time she gave birth to nine of his children. To avoid being captured by law enforcement, Piet used several aliases and forced Rosalind and the children to move dozens of times throughout the US and Mexico. He made Rosalind change her appearance with disguises and by dyeing her hair, using violence and threats to gain her compliance. According to court documents, Piet occasionally took Rosalind to Oklahoma and forced her to mail letters to her family so that they would believe she was nearby and living separately from them by choice. In 2016, Rosalind's oldest son ran away. Shortly thereafter, Rosalind and her eight other children fled the remote village where Piet was holding the family captive. She reported Piet's crimes to the U.S. consular office in Nogales and was returned to the U.S. The FBI launched an investigation into Piet and caught a lucky break in 2017 when he tried obtaining a U.S. passport in Mexico City. Agents tracked his movements to Dallas, Texas, where they arrested him a month later on multiple federal charges relating to his crimes. He was extradited to Oklahoma where he denied the kidnapping and abuse allegations in a jailhouse interview with Fox 23 News, claiming that his relationship with Rosalind was consensual and that she was his wife. Piet's claims of innocence failed to hold up in court and in early 2020, he was sentenced to life in prison for his crimes. Number 10. Wesley Hadsel. 18-year-old college student Angelica A.J. Hadsel vanished while folding laundry during a spring break visit to her family's Norfolk, Virginia home in 2015. Her loved ones arrived home to find laundry strewn all over the room with the radio still playing, indicating that the young woman had been taken against her will. Investigators quickly grew suspicious of AJ's stepfather, Wesley Hadzel, who had been kicked out of the family's home just days earlier for his drug use and strange behavior. He denied any involvement in AJ's disappearance, but remained on law enforcement's radar. About a month later, Investigators followed the GPS movements of Wesley's work vehicle from two days after she went missing, which led them to an abandoned house roughly 50 miles away in Southampton County. Behind the house, they found AJ's body. She was covered in bruises, and there was a large amount of heroin in her system, despite having no history of drug abuse, leading police to believe she had been forcefully overdosed. In addition to the GPS data, Wesley was connected to the crime through DNA evidence and surveillance footage. But prosecutors didn't feel confident moving forward with the case until three years after the crime. Wesley was finally charged with AJ's murder in 2018 and continued to maintain his innocence, arguing in court that the evidence against him was circumstantial. The prosecution, on the other hand, claimed that there were too many coincidences for Wesley to be innocent. The jury agreed and in 2022, he was sentenced to life in prison for AJ's murder. Number 9. Raul Mata On a September morning in 2004, police found a teenager named Dilcia Mahia dead in her Miami-Dade home with a deep laceration to the neck. Her stepfather, Raul Mata, was in the home at the time, and Mahia's death was ruled a homicide. According to court documents, Mahia and Mata had a strained relationship. Mahia disliked Matter and had told a school counselor on at least one previous occasion that he had made inappropriate advances toward her. In the wake of his stepdaughter's death, Matter showed a disturbing lack of sadness during his conversations with the police. He also had suspicious scratches on his arm and there were no signs of forced entry or burglary at the home. 
landing him on law enforcement's radar as a possible suspect, but the authorities did not feel that they had enough evidence to charge Matter with any crimes, and the case soon went cold. After Mejia's murder, Matter moved to California where he remarried, had a child, and moved on with his life as if nothing had happened. A step toward justice finally came 16 years later, in 2020, when he turned up as a DNA match to scrapings from beneath Mejia's fingernails. Matter was arrested on one count of first-degree murder with a deadly weapon and was held in California pending his extradition to Florida. Eight days later, he was found bleeding profusely in his jail cell and was rushed to the hospital. He died from his injuries several weeks later, bringing the long-awaited quest for justice in the case to an unceremonious end. Number 8. Stephen Broderick an entire community in Austin, Texas was thrown into chaos in April of 2021 when a former Travis County Sheriff's deputy rammed his vehicle into his ex-wife's house and shot her and two others in cold blood. 41-year-old Stephen Broderick opened fire on 35-year-old Amanda Broderick, her teenage daughter, Elisa Broderick, and Elisa's boyfriend, Willie Simmons III, while exchanging custody of the son he and Amanda shared. At the time of the shooting, Broderick was out on bond for a pending assault charge stemming from an incident involving Elisa the previous year. Following his arrest in that case, he resigned from his position with the sheriff's office. Not long after that, Amanda filed for divorce and a protective order. She moved to a new home in an attempt to protect her kids and both she and Elisa pleaded with the court not to release Broderick from jail. But their fears fell on deaf ears, and Broderick was cut loose amid the ongoing case. He was initially required to wear an ankle monitor, but obtained the court's permission to have it removed after going several months without any substantial violations. After the triple murder, local roads were closed and the community went into lockdown as police searched high and low for Broderick. Residents were warned not to go outside and those who were away from home when the shelter-in-place order went into effect were not allowed to return home until the order was lifted. People were eventually allowed to resume their normal activities and Broderick was captured after a 20-hour manhunt. In September of 2022, he pleaded guilty to capital murder in order to avoid the death penalty and was sentenced to life without parole. Number 7. Bradley Ritzer Single mom, Kelly Wallace, had no idea that she was bringing a monster into her home when she married Bradley Ritzer. She made this discovery in the most tragic way imaginable following the disappearance of her teenage daughter, Brittany McInnes, in January of 2010. Shortly after Wallace reported McInnes' disappearance, police searched the family's home in Calgary, Alberta, and found no sign of the high school senior. Hours later, McInnes' aunt and sister found her body hidden in the box spring mattress of her bed. She had been brutally assaulted and strangled with the belt of her bathrobe. To the family's horror, DNA from the deceased young woman's fingernail scrapings and the bathrobe belt matched to McInnes' stepfather of 13 years, 45-year-old Bradley Ritzer. He was charged with first-degree murder but maintained his innocence until the 11th hour when he suddenly pleaded guilty shortly before his scheduled trial and admitted to fatally strangling McInnes. Ritzer apologized for his actions during his sentence in hearing, but he never explained why he assaulted and killed his stepdaughter. He's serving a mandatory sentence of life with a minimum of 25 years before he'll be considered for parole. It's unclear why Ritzer decided to change his plea at the last minute, especially since he did so against his lawyer's advice, but even his own sister was relieved by the decision which spared both families from having to endure a painful trial. Number 6. Tasha Lawrence While responding to a report of gunshots in Grovetown, Georgia in May of 2023, Police found 67-year-old Clarence Jordan suffering from multiple bullet wounds in his garage. Neighbors reported seeing Jordan's 44-year-old stepdaughter, Tasha Lawrence, throwing a bouquet of roses on the ground and leaving the scene in her vehicle. Jordan was rushed to the hospital clinging to life. In the meantime, Lawrence turned herself in at a police station and confessed to the shooting. According to law enforcement, Jordan and Lawrence were embroiled in a long-standing disagreement when Lawrence stopped at the residence with flowers for her mother. After encountering Jordan in the garage, she retrieved a gun from her vehicle and opened fire on him. Following her confession, 
Lawrence was initially charged with aggravated assault and possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony. Jordan died three days after the shooting, and she was hit with an additional charge of murder. She remains held without bail at the Columbia County Detention Center as she awaits trial. Number 5. Johnny Oquendo 21-year-old Noel Alcaramla vanished in Lansingburg, New York in late November of 2015 after finishing a late-night waitressing shift at a local restaurant. The last known person to see her alive was a co-worker who dropped her off near her apartment. Police began investigating Alcaramla's disappearance two days later after some of her personal documents were found lying in the street. Investigators cleared Alcaramla's co-worker of suspicion and were quick to cast suspicion on her living girlfriend, Sarah Moore, due to recent relationship problems. Their focus eventually shifted toward Alcaramla's mother's ex-husband, 39-year-old Johnny Oquendo. With no body and a lack of compelling evidence, Authorities were unable to charge him with any crimes, but they discovered that he was wanted on a parole violation, which enabled them to lock him up as the investigation continued. More than a month after Al Karamla went missing, her body was found in a suitcase that was found floating in the Hudson River near Albany. Nearly a year later, while still in jail for his parole violation, Oquendo was charged with second-degree murder, strangulation and concealment of a human corpse. During an interview with the ID Channel show, Dead of Winter, Al Karamla's mother, Deborah Napoli, said that she had no idea that her daughter and Oquendo were even still in touch. She had divorced him years earlier and considered him part of a closed chapter in her life. So she was understandably shocked to learn that they were in contact with one another. While Oquendo's exact reasons for killing his stepdaughter and the nature of their relationship may never be known, his violent criminal history falls in line with the gruesome nature of Al Karamla's death. During his trial in 2017, three neighbors testified to hearing an argument and a loud thud coming from his apartment on the night of Al Karamla's disappearance. They also recalled Oquendo acting nervous while trying to fix a broken banister in the hallway with a large suitcase nearby. One witness claimed that Oquendo told him he had messed up and would need a lawyer during a conversation about a week after Al Karamla vanished. The defense did everything in its power to try destroying the credibility of the prosecution's witnesses, but the jury was unswayed. After deliberating for less than three hours, they found Oquendo guilty of Al Karamla's murder, and he was sentenced to 27 years to life in prison. Number 4. Bray Hansen in July of 2007, 911 dispatchers in San Diego County, California, received an emergency call from a teenager named Bray Hansen, who claimed that a masked intruder had shot her stepdad. Officers arrived to find 63-year-old criminal defense attorney Timothy McNeil bound and dead with four bullet wounds, including two gunshots to the head. Also at the home was Hansen, whose hands were bound behind her back with zip ties. She claimed she had used her tongue to dial 911. As crazy as it sounded, law enforcement initially believed that McNeil and Hansen were victims of a robbery gone wrong, but Hansen's story began to fall apart during questioning, and it eventually became obvious to investigators that she was lying in the meantime. Witnesses described seeing a man resembling the young woman's brother, 20-year-old Nathaniel Gann, fleeing the scene. The siblings were detained on suspicion of murder, and a jailhouse informant soon came forward and claimed that Gan had been talking about the crime. He was able to provide authorities with information that only someone at the murder scene would have known, which proved that he was being truthful and only added to law enforcement's suspicions that Gan was involved in McNeil's murder, describing Hansen as an attention seeker who needed to be in the spotlight at all times. McNeil's family accused her of killing her stepfather because she thought she stood to receive a large inheritance. Hansen's lawyer argued that his client had tried to call off the plot, but that Gan forced her to go through with it. In 2009, a jury concluded that Hansen had masterminded the plot and found both her and Gan guilty of first-degree murder. Gan was sentenced to 25 years to life while Hansen received a life sentence without parole, which was eventually reduced to a minimum of 26 years. Number 3. Jay Jenks 
by all appearances, 37-year-old Jade Sasha Janks and her stepfather, 64-year-old Tom Merriman, had a good relationship. They remained close even after Jade's mother and Merriman divorced and lived next door to one another in Encinitas, California. In December of 2020, Merriman suffered a serious fall at his home, landing him at the hospital followed by a rehab center. During his absence, Janks stopped at his house to clean and noticed an explicit photo of herself on his computer screensaver. Shocked by the discovery, she looked through the computer and found dozens of intimate images which she had taken consensually with her past partners but had never shared with Merriman. About a week later, shortly after Merriman's return home, he was found dead in his driveway beneath a pile of trash. He had been drugged with prescription pills, strangled and suffocated three days earlier on New Year's Eve. The discovery came after a friend of Jade's named Adam Sipoljak told law enforcement that she had asked him to help her move her stepfather's remains. Sipoljak claimed that Jade had confessed to killing Merriman but that he wasn't sure whether she was telling the truth. After searching Merriman's property for two days, investigators found his body. Janks was charged with first-degree murder but maintained her innocence and took her case to trial. Prosecutors showed the court text messages that she had sent to a friend about dosing the hell out of Merriman and struggling to move his body. In one message, she wrote, I'm not sure how much longer I can control my temper and talked about wanting to club Merriman as he awoke from his drug-induced stupor. The defense argued that Merriman died from poor health and an accidental drug overdose, claiming that Janks panicked and hid his body because she was worried that she would be blamed for his death. But they failed to convince the jury of her innocence, and in early 2023, she was found guilty of murder. She was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison and continues to maintain her innocence as she appeals her case from behind bars. Today's topic was requested by Julius King 9374 and Nikki123BXD. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Maisha Williams. In January of 2019, 59-year-old Terence Gibson was fatally gunned down by a masked shooter in Deland, Florida. According to police, the gunman approached Gibson from behind and shot him four times in the back of the head while he sat around a bonfire with some friends. The shooter then fled the scene on foot and sped off in a getaway car that was waiting nearby. Based on their findings, investigators identified Gibson's stepdaughter, 31-year-old Maisha Williams, as a suspect in the case. Other evidence led them to Williams' boyfriend, 43-year-old Perry Stanley Sr., who they believe was paid to kill Gibson so Williams could collect on his life insurance policy, which had recently been increased from $25,000 to $750,000. While there was no evidence linking Williams directly to the crime scene, detectives theorized that she masterminded the murder plot and drove the getaway car. Text messages between her and Stanley further pointed toward her involvement in the murder. In June of 2020, nearly a year and a half after the crime, Williams and Stanley were finally arrested on suspicion of first-degree murder. More than five years after Gibson's death, records show that both defendants' cases are ongoing. In the meantime, they remain held without bond at the Volusia County Jail. If these stepchild setbacks weren't enough for you, stay tuned till after number one because we've got when Tinder dates go wrong coming right up. You won't believe what happened during seemingly innocent romantic outings. Number 1. Gregory Graff 33-year-old Jessica Paget vanished in November of 2014 after leaving the daycare where she worked to use her stepfather's fax machine at his home in Edgewater, Florida. Five days later, her murdered body was found behind a shed on the property. Paget had been shot in the back of the head by her stepfather. Gregory Graff, who then proceeded to film himself abusing the woman's corpse. The murder came just weeks after Paget's mother, Danelle Bittner, had asked Graff for a divorce. Additional evidence further pointed toward Graff being the killer, including a pair of bloody sandals and bloodstains in his mattress and carpet. He was also seen on surveillance video buying items that were used in the crime, 
and hide in Paget's car after she was killed. Following the discovery of Paget's body, Graf confessed to her murder and was charged accordingly. A jury found him guilty of first-degree murder and defiling a corpse in 2015 after deliberating for just six minutes. He was sentenced to life without parole and remained in prison after unsuccessfully appealing his case, claiming he acted in a drug-induced rage and had no memory of killing Paget. Number 9. Lauren Marie Dooley On September the 28th of 2022, Lauren Marie Dooley tortured a 21-year-old man she'd met on Tinder after restraining him with duct tape in her Colorado apartment. The victim's name was redacted from the affidavit released to the public in order to preserve his privacy. He indicated that he and 22-year-old Dooley had been intimate with one another in the moments before she tied him up to her bed. He reluctantly consented, but the situation quickly escalated to violence. Once he was restrained, Dooley began slashing him with a knife and choked him when he protested. Following the assault, she reportedly ordered food, threatening to kill her victim if he attempted to alert the delivery driver. After Dooley fell asleep, the man managed to break free from his restraints and fled the apartment fully naked. His captor chased after him and concerned neighbors called 911. When the police arrived at the scene, they discovered bloody rags and sheets, as well as the knife she'd used during the attack. The victim was taken to the hospital and treated for his non-life-threatening injuries, while Dooley was taken into custody and charged with second-degree kidnapping and assault. Number 8. Ashiri Gadsden A 21-year-old South Carolina resident participated in the murder of Alan Philpian Johnson III following a robbery gone wrong on January the 9th of 2022. Ashiri Gadsden had initially met the 24-year-old victim on Tinder. She formulated a plot to trick the young man into allowing her into his house, along with her accomplices Joshua Latre Mack, aged 28, and Zora Simone Henderson, aged 19. The ill-intentioned trio eventually killed the homeowner, after which a heavily intoxicated Gadsden contacted the police and waited for them in the driveway. She led them into the victim's apartment, where officers came upon Johnson's lifeless body. An autopsy would later reveal that he'd been shot four times during the home invasion. Officers arrested Gadsden, who initially claimed that she'd had nothing to do with the crime. During questioning, she told detectives that she'd heard a gunshot while in the bathroom and rushed into the living room to discover her date lying unresponsive on the ground. However, detectives discovered deleted messages in the suspect's cell phone that implicated her involvement. Gadsden finally confessed to plotting the robbery but claimed that Mac had been the one to shoot Johnson after the latter had attempted to disarm him. Number 7. Luis Savondo Almanza, Aranana, Mornin Martinez and Sierra Petit In September of 2021, an unidentified man was held hostage for several hours by Luis Savondo Almanza, Aranana, Mornin Martinez and Sierra Petit following an ill-fated Tinder date. The trio, aged between 19 and 26 at the time, invited the victim to a house party in Oklahoma City. After he asked to be paid back for the drinks he'd purchased for the group, tensions escalated and violence ensued. Almanza, Martinez, and Petit held the man captive, threatening him with a 12-gauge shotgun and a knife. He was forced into a car and the suspects drove him to several stores, using his bank cards to purchase various items, including clothes. They also allegedly destroyed the man's phone in order to keep him from calling for help. Before eventually releasing him, the three suspects threatened to harm him and his family if he contacted the authorities. The victim decided to report the incident nonetheless. The police subsequently arrested Almanza, Martinez and Petit on charges of kidnapping and aggravated robbery. Number 6. Mika Ort Mika Ort, a 21-year-old woman attending university in the Netherlands, was murdered by a Tinder date turned stalker. On March the 8th of 2022, Ort, who was born to a Dutch father, had traveled from Massachusetts to Leeuwarden in 2020 in order to pursue her studies. She went on several dates with a 27-year-old man identified only as Thomas R., whom she'd met on the dating app before eventually deciding to rekindle her relationship with ex-boyfriend Michael Van Der Waal. 
Refusing to accept the young woman's rejection, Thomas tracked her down, placed the GPS device on her bike, and broke into her apartment. He proceeded to fatally stab Ort, also wounding two other men who were at the house at the time of the attack. Thomas fled the scene in the aftermath, but was later turned into the authorities by his parents. Number five, Jordan Cobold. Jordan Cobold, a 21-year-old resident of Suffolk, England, trashed Alicia Moy's apartment after she ended their Tinder romance on April the 9th of 2021. The couple had been dating for a month when Moy, aged 20 at the time, decided that they weren't a good match. Cobalt became irate and took the young woman's spear key in retaliation. Moy explained the breakup by expressing her belief that he'd grown too intense and needy. After she ended their relationship over text message, Cobalt blocked her number and waited until she left for work to enter her apartment. The scorned lover poured beans and spaghetti into her shoes, painted the walls with condiments and covered the vacuum cleaner with cooking sauce. Cobalt also severed cables on each of Moy's kitchen appliances, turned off the refrigerator's power and threw cooking oil on the floor. The young man was arrested after his ex contacted the authorities about his infantile actions. In January of 2022, he accepted a plea deal in connection to charges of criminal damage and burglary. Cobalt was consequently ordered to serve 180 hours of community service, as well as two years of probation. He was also forced to pay his victim $1,750 in restitution and was forbidden from making any form of contact with Moy for five years. Number four, Levante Stuckey. On July the 9th of 2022, Levante Stuckey attempted to assault his Tinder date, holding her at gunpoint in the garage of a Las Vegas hotel. The woman whose identity wasn't made public agreed to a meet up with Stuckey and got into his car, at which point he locked the doors and allegedly became violent. The man forced his victim into the back seat, demanding she perform intimate acts while threatening her with a firearm. During the course of the altercation, the woman somehow managed to use her phone to contact a friend who helped her escape from the assailant's vehicle. Stucky then sped away from the scene, hitting two other cars in the process. The two women contacted the authorities, providing them with Stucky's license plate number, which eventually led to his arrest. He was charged with kidnapping and his bail was set at $10,000. Number three, Sierra Wayman. Kentucky teen Sierra Wayman set up a meeting with Covington resident Peyton Browning over Tinder, secretly plotting to extort money from him. On September the 8th of 2020, Wayman invited Browning over to her house. Minutes after he arrived, two strangers knocked on the door. One of them was later identified as 19-year-old Philip Snyder, while the second man wasn't identified to the public. They attempted to assault Browning, who was carrying a weapon and shot at his attackers in self-defense. Police subsequently arrived at the scene after having been contacted by Browning himself, and the two assailants were taken to the ER with non-fatal gunshot wounds. 19-year-old Wayman was taken to the Kenton County Jail on robbery charges. A bond was set at $5,000 by the judge presiding over her case. Number two, Joshua Hamblett, Sashwana Wilkins, and Keegan Profet. In 2019, 23-year-olds Joshua Hamblett and Sashwana Wilkins, along with 19-year-old Keegan Profet, were arrested in Ontario, Canada, after attempting to traffic a woman they'd met on Tinder. The woman who chose to remain anonymous told the police that she'd agreed to meet one of the suspects in a hotel room, but the man became violent once they were alone. It suspected that Profet was the individual in charge of making initial contact with the victim, although his accomplices arrived at the hotel room shortly thereafter. After taking lewd pictures of the woman and uploading them online, the trio offered her services on the ad listing site, Leo List. Hamlet, Wilkins, and Profet pressured her into performing escort services by threatening her family if she refused. They also confiscated the money she received during her appointments. The two 23-year-olds were arrested on December the 1st of 2019, while Profet managed to elude capture until the 18th. They were each charged with over a dozen combined offenses, including assault, making threats, and human trafficking. 
Police suspected the group of targeting other women with similar schemes and urged any of their past victims to come forward. Number 1. Jose Sandoval Joaquez and Crystal Halsey Jose Sandoval Joaquez, 32, and Crystal Halsey, 33, were accused of catfishing a man on Tinder in order to carry out a robbery on September the 17th of 2022, when the unnamed victim showed up for a date with a woman he knew only as Sonia at a hotel room in Phoenix, Arizona. The two suspects allegedly held him at gunpoint, demanding his cell phone and bank account information. The man was then forced to drive his assailants to a nearby bank, where he withdrew $900 from his account. Juarez and Halsey subsequently took off on their own and managed to withdraw $3,000 more before the bank cards were reported stolen and deactivated. Detectives assigned to the case discovered that the couple had booked the hotel room using their real names, leading to their arrest on September the 28th. The suspects led police on a high-speed chase through several cities driving on the wrong side of the road and attempting to carjack another vehicle before finally being apprehended. They were indicted for assault and armed robbery with a deadly weapon as well as several other charges as they awaited the continuation of their case's legal proceedings. Thanks for watching. Would you rather be imprisoned in a luxurious prison somewhere in Scandinavia or live on the streets of San Francisco? Let us know in the comments section below.